two services at 9.15 and 10.45 celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. We will not be having small groups that day, but we encourage all of you to worship an hour and serve an hour. So get connected with a team leader to get plugged in to a place where you can serve the church in that way. We'll also be having a prayer vigil on the Saturday before Easter. You can sign up for a time in the vestibule and you can pray anywhere you like. This time of prayer is specifically for those who will be coming through our doors on Easter Sunday. We want to make sure that we lift them up in prayer to the very best of our ability. We'd love to see you at all of these Easter events coming up this week as we celebrate Easter together. Next week on April the 26th, our church will be playing host to Secret Church. This was started by David Platt in Birmingham, Alabama several years ago and has expanded to a worldwide one night only a year event. It will begin at 7 p.m. in the chapel and we're inviting all of you to come and join us. You can visit the link below to get registered for the event and the cost is $8 which covers your booklet for the evening. This is a great time of intense Bible study and fervent prayer for persecuted Christians around the world. If you have any questions, I would be glad to answer them. Just find me sometime today during the service and I will be happy to get you all the information that you need. Until then, sign up for Secret Church at the website below, and we'll see you on April the 26th in the chapel at 7 p.m. In conjunction with Mother's Day on May the 12th, we will be having our annual parent-child dedication. Baby dedication is something that we take very seriously at First Baptist Church of Grey, and we want to make sure it's a special time for all those involved. If you have a child that you would like to have dedicated this year, now is the time to do it. You can sign up at the link below where you can also find information about the orientation supper. All your questions can be answered on that website, but if you have need of further information, you can find Laura Wright and she'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. But go ahead and mark your calendars now, April 28th for the baby dedication orientation dinner and then Mother's Day, May the 12th, for parent-child dedication. We're looking forward to celebrating all of these young families this year. What's her last name? Hmm. Last service we had Aaron Frazier. That's it. Thank you very much. Aaron Frazier joined the church. Uh, moved her letter from another church and her daughter Emma Robertson made a profession of faith in the last service. So off to a good start, right? Well, uh, my name is Randy Darnell. I've been called as pastor of the First Baptist Church in case y'all have missed this guy, you know, last couple of weeks. We've been gone, appreciate it very much. We had a good time. Went to the Gospel Coalition Conference in Indianapolis for three days and then we went to see uh, Ben and Anna up in Illinois where it is snowing at his house today. And, uh, and in Michigan, so we had, a, we had a very good trip. Thank you for letting us go and do all that. I want to welcome you here this morning. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we'd like to invite you, if you would, first, thank you very much for allowing the Lord to lead you to First Baptist to worship today, and we would ask you, if you would, to complete one of our guest cards that's in the back of the pew there. It's a fairly large card. It doesn't have a lot of information on it. We'd love to contact you. If you don't want to be contacted, you can check on there as well. One of the things we do, though, for every one of those cards that we receive, we donate $5 to the Covenant Care Organization in Macon, which helps uh, women out when they find themselves in a difficult situation. So you're doing a good thing by filling out the card, and we'd appreciate that very much. Uh, several things I want to remind you. We haven't talked about this. I don't know that we've talked about this in a long, long time. There is inclement weather coming. Let me know, y'all. I'm y'all know, y'all know. I'm I'm an old fuddy duddy when it comes to all this stuff. We've been having thunderstorms ever since I was born. But now on the news, it's going to be apocalyptic. Every time we're going to have half a mile an hour of wind, you need to hide somewhere and stay hidden until it's all over. When I was a kid, we used to love thunderstorms and the hard wind and all that kind of stuff, and now we're terrified. You don't have to be terrified. You don't have to stay home. We've had rain before, but if we did have something bad happen, if the tornado sirens do go off, just so you know what to do, I will run screaming down this center aisle, <laughs> And you all follow me and I'll take you to a safe place. Actually, what we're going to do, 
Should the tornado sirens go off, if you have children downstairs, do not run to get your children. The children will be taken out of their area and they'll be moved. Y'all know where the children's area is underneath us? They'll move them into the hallway that runs underneath this building and underneath the chapel because that's where we go in a tornado. We've done it before. We've had tornado sirens go off and we've gone over there before. So they'll be over there. We will all exit and go to the same place. There is a door here that you can go out. There is a stairwell here, a stairwell down midway in this hallway. You could go all the way to the very end and circle back. You can go out this door here to the main stairwell, circle out and go through the children's area that way. Anyway, if the tornado sirens go off, that's what we would do. You'll be safe down there. If the kids get jittery, we might start singing some songs. We've done that before to calm them down just a little bit. And you can sing a song to calm the pastor down. And it'll all be real good. So just want to let you know that's how that operates. Don't want you to forget. Colors, the light colors. Logan has had them purple for the entire time of Lent. Why they have been purple is purple represents... <clears throat> Purple represents repentance because we understand what Jesus did for our sins. That's, it's our, you know, we're, we're being grateful for what he's done. Now it is Palm Sunday this week, and Palm Sunday it's purple for a different reason. Purple is a royal color. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. He is coming in as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's what this represents. So that's why he's got us lit up in purple, highlighted in purple this morning. So just so you know that. One more thing to, to announce to you. Uh, you're going to see more and more about this. Uh, if you are 18 to 30 years old or you have somebody that's 18 to 30 years old, we're going to start on May the 2nd a new small group that's going to meet on Thursday evenings at Kim and Michael Heiss's house. Uh, you'll be getting information and directions and all that. It'll meet every Thursday from 5.30 until 8.15. Gonna sing uh, a little bit, gonna eat, gonna study the word together. Kim's a good cook, you'll wanna go for the food if nothing else. And Logan and Becca are gonna be leading the study. So 18, 30 years old, if you are in that age group or you've got somebody that's in that age group, invite them to come. As the fall gets closer, we're going to have a couple of new classes that we're going to form on Sunday morning that that age group can also go to as well as other folks. So when you invite your one, there'll be a, a new place that they can go to. How cool is that? Thinking ahead. That's cool. All right. I think that's got everything that I was supposed to announce this morning. So let's stand together and let's read our scripture of the week. Palm Sunday, right? Jesus is walking into town, walking, riding into town on a donkey. People are lining the streets with palm fronds, laying them in front of him as he walks, as the donkey walks along. And this is that story. It said, those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's Mark 11, 9. Father, we thank you for calling us together this morning. We thank you that you died not for us individually only, but you died for us corporately as a body. You have formed us into a peculiar people, a set-apart people, that we are priests for you in this world, and you've brought us together to be one in this place to worship you. I pray, Father, as we do what we do this morning, that we would hear your voice that your spirit would speak to us and that we would worship you all the more. You are worthy of our praise. You have done so many things that we don't, we're not even aware of. And Father, help us this morning to understand a little bit deeper and to walk away from this place this morning knowing that our Lord reigns in heaven and on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Like our pastor said, today is Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus rode triumphantly into the city. So let's remember it because we have a king that is worthy to be praised. Sing with us. Oh,
strive on this terrestrial ball. To Him all majesty ascribe and crown Him Lord of all. To Him all majesty ascribe and crown Him Lord of all.
This is what the world looks like sometimes. Look at faces in a crowd and it's easier to see the crowd, not the faces. It's the way we are. But zoom in to one face, one person at a time. And if you look close enough, you might see what we see. The girl who gets high every day before school so she won't feel anything. Or the just immigrated Chinese mom who teaches her kids there's no God because that's all she's ever known. Where the world sees a crowd, we see a person close up. We're the ones who speak hope to them. We're the missionaries you send when you give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. We see what hope can do and we can't sit still because this hope, it's the hope of the gospel. It's a powerful thing. It pushes us to leave whatever is comfortable. It shows the lost someone is looking for them and it gives you and us a mission to complete together. In Puerto Rico and Portland and Montreal and Miami, in college towns and small towns and big cities, in every language, in every North American life, Jesus saves. We've seen it. And all he asks is that we missionaries, churches, Everyday believers, share what we have. Give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And this is what happens. New churches start. Those who are far off are brought near. And together, we send hope. Father, that you remind us of who you are and remind us of what you do. God, that when we do see you, all of our fears are washed away. All of our sins are washed away when we come to faith in you. And so, God, we pray that as we give this morning that we would get to take part in others coming to faith in you and feeling that feeling of having their sins washed away. In Jesus' name, amen.
First thing, amen. <laughs> Second thing, I cannot tell you how glad they are to put that song to rest. <laughs> I have worked them real, real hard on that song, but man, it's just, uh, it was the perfect song for Palm Sunday. Uh, two of those songs were actually, um, two of the, that was a big medley as you gathered, but two of the songs in there were direct quotations of Psalms, Psalm 8 and Psalm, 60, Psalm 66. So um, they were singing scripture, and it's a beautiful time to do it. Um, I direct your attention to the word of God and the gospel of Luke. Hear the word of the Lord. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, you shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road, and as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Two things I want you to notice here. The first is what seems simple, is what Jesus wrote in on. What did he write in on? A donkey. So he rode into the place of his death, to the city of his death, on a donkey. 33 years before, he rode into another city, the city of his birth. And what did he ride in on? A donkey. In a different form, of course. But I find it very hard to believe that God made that a coincidence. I think it's a perfect picture of when Christ said, I, the, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And riding in on a donkey is a perfect picture of humility for the Son of Man. The second thing is what he told the Pharisees when he, when he rebuked him and said, tell your disciples to be quiet. And he said, even the rocks would cry out if they were silent. So if they didn't sing or if they didn't praise the name of the Lord, the rocks were going to do it. And I think the same is very true here. If we don't sing, if we don't tell of his mighty works, the rocks will. So I tell you what, why don't we tell those rocks that they can have the day off? Because we have a reason to sing. We have a reason to tell of his worth and to make his praise glorious. Because we have been redeemed. Those rocks have not been redeemed. We have been redeemed by the man of sorrows. Would you stand and let's sing that together.
because of that cross. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me, who the Son sets free, oh, is free in me. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full, by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the chapter 23. We're not going to be in Philippians for a couple of weeks because we're at Easter time. So we're going to, uh, we're going to talk about the crucifixion. I did wonder uh, if Logan directed his tie off. I noticed as he was leading the, the choir song that something orange flew to the ground. And then a few minutes later, I just wondered, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, this is the lead up to the actual crucifixion event. And uh, we're going to deal with that next week. Uh, I want to implore to you that uh, next week is Easter. Please come to church. Uh, please invite your friends to church. It's the greatest time to do invite your one because it is the most non-confrontational Sunday of the year. Everybody's supposed to go to church on Easter. So in, they, they're expecting your invitation. Throw that invitation out there and get them to come. I know that it's a good day to get together with family and, it's, and, and our congregation. I never, you know, it's like a box of chocolates. I never know what I'm gonna get because sometimes all of the uh, uh, mature people go to their children's house and then sometimes the children come here and you don't know if it's gonna be full or empty or what's gonna happen. But let me implore you, if you're going to your children's house, go to church and if everybody's coming here, come to church next Sunday. It's Easter is... Is a big, it's a big deal. Without Easter, Paul says that we are uh, greatly to be pitied. Um, let's get some background on what we're going to read real quick. Before this scripture took place, Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room to celebrate the Jewish Passover meal. At that, uh, at that meal, you know, that's when he instituted the Lord's Supper. And we are going to celebrate that this coming Friday from 7 until 8 o'clock. Kim will be playing the piano for that hour. And we've done this once before and had folks that have come in and stayed the whole hour. We've had folks that have come in and stayed for five minutes. Do whatever you feel God's leading you to do. If you want to, if the opportunity's here, come, listen to music. I'll be serving communion, so when you're ready, you come down front, we serve, and, and that's what we do. It's a very good time to remember what Jesus did for us. He instituted that on that night. 
Then they left there. They went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus prayed very passionately to his father. You remember it says, Scripture says, it was as though he had drops of blood. He was praying so hard. And he listened attentively, telling his father that if we can get away from having to do it this way, I'd love for that to happen. But it didn't. So uh, he heard what the father said, and then he was obedient. Judas came, kissed him on the cheek to let them know who to arrest. I never really understood that. I mean, it's not like Jesus had been a recluse and nobody had seen him before. They certainly knew what he looked like. To me, that's like one final insult that Judas got to throw at Jesus there. And then the, the temple guards took Jesus back to the Sanhedrin. Uh, Peter followed them three times. Y'all know the story? Uh, I hope you know the story that three times Peter was asked Weren't you one of them? Didn't you follow him? Aren't you one of the followers? Three times he said no. The third time he cursed at them. He was so vehement to, to know I want to separate myself from Jesus. That's when the rooster crowed. And it says that Peter wept bitterly because of that. I, I'm pretty easy on Peter about that because I know when I look in the mirror, I see a guy that's done the same thing. There's been opportunities that I've had to speak up that I've not spoken up. And I know that we all have that. So let's give Peter, some, give Peter some grace here. The temple guards were rough men. They dragged Jesus in. They, they uh, tormented him. And then we get to this story where we come before Pilate. It's Luke chapter 23, verses 1 through 25. Then the whole assembly rose up and brought him before Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation, opposing payment of taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you say so. Peter then took his chief priest and uh, told the chief priest and the crowds, I find no grounds for charging this man. But they kept insisting. He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee where he started, even to here. When Pilate heard this, he asked if the man was a Galilean, and finding out that he was, under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem during those days. Now Herod was very glad to see Jesus because for a long time he'd wanted to see him because he'd heard about him. He's hoping to see some miracle performed by him. So he kept asking him questions, but Jesus didn't answer him. The chief priests and the scribes stood by vehemently accusing him. Then Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt, mocked him, dressed him in bright clothing, and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Previously, they'd been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the leaders of the people, and he said to them, you've brought me this man as one who misleads the people, but in fact, after examining him in, in your presence, I found no grounds to charge this man with those things you accuse him of. Neither has Herod, because he sent him back to us. Clearly, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I'll have him whipped and then release him. Then they all cried together, take this man away, release Barabbas to us. He had been thrown into prison for rebellion that had taken place in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate addressed them again, but they kept shouting, crucify, crucify him. And a third time he said to them, why? What has this man done wrong? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I'll have him whipped and then release him. But they kept up the pressure, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified, and their voices won out. So Pilate decided to grant their demand and released the one they were asking for, who had been thrown into prison for rebellion and murder, but he handed Jesus over to their will. I went to the Gospel Coalition Conference in Indianapolis last week. Uh, that's why I was gone on the, the first Sunday. John Piper was the first speaker. I've always wanted to hear John Piper speak. I've never heard him in, per in person before. Now, as a pastor, I cr critique every pastor that I listen to. Every sermon I critique. That's not unusual. If you're a teacher, you know, and you go to a teaching conference, you're critiquing that teacher as they teach. You know, if you're a firefighter and you go to an early, res uh, early responders seminar somewhere, you're critiquing the people that are talking. That's just what we do. And I can tell you that John Piper broke every rule that they trained me in seminary about how to teach, how to preach a sermon. 
In, certain, in seminary, they told us that, that a congregation cannot handle more than three points. Don't give them a whole lot of extra stuff. Just hammer those three things and, and be done and go home and save something for later. Piper didn't do that. Piper had like five points. Each point had multiple sub points and some of his sub points had sub points. But I took more notes on his sermon than I did anybody else's sermon that I listened to over the course of those three days. And the thing that he said has kept haunting me over and over and over again. Now he was preaching on Mark chapter eight, verses 31 through 38. His sermon title was Unashamed to be Scorned with Jesus. And his primary point at the very beginning was the sovereignty of God. And, and we're, gonna, we're gonna give that as a gimme this morning. I believe, and I believe we as a church believe that God is sovereign that he is in control, that nothing happens that God doesn't touch, that nothing happens that surprises him or that's outside of his control, that he is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent, that everything that is is through his hands, period. I believe that God's sovereign. I believe if anything surprises God, then he's not God anymore. Nothing comes as a surprise to him, so that's gonna be a given. But Piper laid out four points that I want us to, to talk about those four things this morning in a little different context because these things, as I listened to what he said and I started applying it myself, realized the basis of, when we start understanding and start comprehending these things, the difference it's gonna make in our faith and it's gonna make in our lives. If we believe that God changes people we're gonna talk about how he does that and, and, and how we can have assurance of all that. So anyway, we're gonna do it. I'm not preaching Piper's sermon. If I was preaching his sermon, y'all would be here for a long time. He talked for an hour solid, never missed a beat. And when I got through, I was wanting them to go another hour. It was incredible listening to him, it was dynamite. But he did have four things to say that I want us to take a look at in a little different light this morning. He started with uh, verse 31 in Mark 8, read it when you get home. It says, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must. Now, words are important. Words are important. So listen to the words that are used here. Jesus began to teach his disciples that he, the Son of Man, must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. Jesus taught his disciples that he must, that he must, that these things must happen to him, that he must suffer, he must be rejected, he must be killed, and that he must rise. Now, our argument is, many of us that have been in church forever, our argument is, well, of course he did. Of course he had to. He had to do those things. He had to die for all of our sins. And that'd be correct, but that's not the depth of the story. One of, one of our favorite things to eat at the house is chocolate pie. Just a quick chocolate, not a big, just a quick chocolate pie. Get a crust, you put some filling on top of it, you put some Cool Whip on top of it. Whoop, that's good. You know, I'm happy, got a chocolate pie. When you stop at this point and say, well, of course he did. Jesus had to die for my sins. You're eating the Cool Whip off the top. It's good, and it's not wrong, but it's not the whole story. It's much more satisfying when you eat a chocolate pie if there's some chocolate in the chocolate pie. I had a sister-in-law once that made a lemon meringue pie. She forgot to put the lemon in it. It wasn't quite, you know? It just wasn't quite. If you're gonna, you need, and that's what we need to see here. There's more, there is more to it here. He must die. What does the word must mean? Must means to be obligated, to be required, to be compelled. Do you hear that? To be obligated. Jesus understood that he was obligated. He understood that he was required. He understood that he was compelled. Now let that sink in a little bit. He, he knew that he was <clears throat> that he was obligated to do this. And we'll argue again, well, yeah, he did that for my sins, but yeah, was that all? Was there something more? Was there something more wondrous? Was there a more wondrous purpose behind Jesus' suffering? Was there a more wondrous purpose behind his rejection and his dying and his being raised? 
Four things we want to look at. Four things we want to look at. Number one, first thing we want to look at is this. Jesus understood that he must suffer, be rejected, die, and rise because it is written and the scripture can't be broken. You understand? Because it is written and the scripture can't be broken. And everybody in here is going, well, uh-huh, uh-huh, of course. That's right, it's in the scripture. Can't be broken. It's in the scripture and it can't be broken. Well, it is in the scripture. If you threw out all the other messianic text in the Old Testament and just went to Isaiah 53, that would be enough. I'm gonna read seven through 10 for you, Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Read the story just a minute ago. He stood before Herod. What did he say to Herod? Nair word. He didn't say one thing to Herod at all, like a sheep before a slaughter, uh, before a shearer is quiet. Jesus was quiet before Herod. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? He had to die. And there they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he'd done no violence, what did Pilate say? I can't find anything wrong with this man. And there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to, to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now I know what you're gonna say. I know what you're gonna say. I know that you're going to say, well, of course, Jesus had to die for our sins. He must do that. If it's in the scripture, then it can't be broken. But now let's move away from this and let's move into something else. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter six. He said, therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. Now, wait a minute. If the scripture can't be broken, if it's in the scripture, the scripture can't be broken, this can't be broken either, can it? So if you're going through some time that is making you very anxious and, and there's all kinds of things that are causing anxiety in your life, this scripture can't be broken. What it says is, if you will seek him first and his righteousness first, then all of the anxiety will be tempered. That the anxiety may not be completely removed, the anxiety will be tempered with the understanding that it's gonna be all right. That the Lord does what he does. That everything that happens to you passes through his hand. The scripture cannot be broken. That scripture is gonna be true too. What about this scripture? We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Something bad's going on in your life. Somebody you've li that you love is hurt, sick, got a terminal disease, yet you still grab hold of this verse, understanding that all things work to good because if the scripture cannot be broken, then this has to be true, right? Right? Absolutely, right? This is a confession of faith for us that no matter what occurs in my life comes through the hand of God and as his child, he is going to work it out to my benefit, to my family's benefit, to the benefit of the body of believers. I don't know where he's gonna work it out to, but I know that it's gonna work out for the good because scripture can't be broken. He also says, what a wretched man am I? Romans seven, Paul says this, what a wretched man I am. I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You may have done something or you know somebody that has done something so heinous they think they can never be forgiven. Paul says, who can save this wretch that I am? Thanks be to God, Jesus Christ can save me. Jesus Christ can save me. Thanks be to the Lord. Scripture can't be broken. That's gotta be true, right? So when we make the faith statement at this point that Jesus died, he must do these things because scripture can't be broken, then if scripture can't be broken, all these other things are true just as well. It's a faith statement on our part. Point number two. Point number two says, Jesus must suffer, be rejected, be killed, and be raised 
because God not only predicts, but he performs his word. That God not only predicts, but he performs his word. I've got a verse that I hang on to as the pastor. I've hung on to this forever because there are times, and y'all know this, there are times if you are a school teacher, I think you could probably relate to this as good as anybody in the world. If you're a school teacher, you go into the class and you are so excited that today's the day. You figured this thing out and you've got this way that you're going to present this to everybody and you're going to see all their little eyes light up and everybody's going to get a smile on their face and they're going to go, oh, you're so smart, Mr. Darnell. And oh, this is so good and I wish, oh, I can't wait to go home and tell mom and daddy. And you just think, oh, this is going to be great. This is going to be the greatest thing that I've ever presented to a class ever. And you walk in and you teach it to them and they all stare at you like you've got three heads. And you know they're sitting there hearing, wonk, 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 wonk. And you're so disappointed because, God, it's so good. Pastors do that. I come in especially with it since we've been doing Philippians. I don't know why the light switch went on in Philippians. But going through Philippians, I come in here on some Sunday mornings going, you got to hear this. you got to know this. This is the greatest thing I've ever heard. This is wonderful. you got to get it. And then I look out and I look at some of y'all and I see a few light bulbs going off. And I see a few people that are going, well, now we got to get the chips and the potato chips when we leave. And make sure we get Uncle Henry and Aunt Martha to attend. And I'm not dogging you out because I've sat on that back pew back there by my beloved bride and done the same thing. I know, I know, I know. That's why I hang on to this verse. This verse says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. God's saying here, what I say, I will do. What I say, I will do. And if my word is preached, if my word is spoken, if my word is read, then it's going to serve the purpose that I put it out there for. And I finally learned a long time ago that it's not my job to convince y'all or to make you feel good or make you walk out of here going blah, blah, blah. My job is to put the word out there and let the Holy Spirit do his job. Holy Spirit will reach into you and touch you and change you. And the crazy thing is, is I've had people meet me before after service and tell me, preacher, when you said so-and-so, that is exactly what I needed to hear this morning. That was the greatest thing. And they walk off and I go, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Wasn't even in my sermon this morning. Holy Spirit ministering to their heart. His, he, he not only predicts, but he performs. Now think of the ramifications of that. If you hold on to this word with all of your heart and you understand that it cannot be broken and that he's going to perform it, understand what he's saying to you. We said, we read Romans 8, 28 a minute ago. You know, all things work together for good. 29 and 30. For those he foreknew, <clears throat> he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. <clears throat> and those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. If God performs his word as we affirm that he does, then he will call us to be his. When he does, he will justify us. Everything you've ever done, every sin. And I said this to somebody the other day and they literally said to me, really? It's true. Every sin that you have ever done, every sin that you're going to do that you haven't done yet, you're forgiven of. Do you understand? When you trust Christ as your savior, when God comes into your heart, you are forgiven. You're washed clean of everything that's ever going to happen ever, ever, ever. And not only that, not only are you made righteous, not only are you made right in God's eyes, but he says from this moment forward, I'm going to start growing you up. And I'm going to teach you and I'm going to make you like Jesus. I'm going to sanctify you, to use a church word, I'm going to make you more and more like Jesus. And in there, he doesn't say, if you want me to. He doesn't say, if I have your permission. He doesn't say, if you'll do what I say. What he says is those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, which says that you become mine, I'm working on you. Well, I don't know that I want that. Then you better not trust Jesus as your savior. 
Because the scripture says, it won't be, he says, it won't be broken. He's going to do what he says. And what he says is he's going to make you more like him every day. And we've talked about this once before, but I want to make sure you understand it. If you've been a Christian for more than an hour, you can already see things changing in your life. You can look back on your life now, even now when you feel like a dog, like you've done something wrong, you've really made a big mistake, you can look back and realize, you know what, I am a different person today than I was five years ago, ten years ago, and it's because God has changed me. It's not because I've been on a self-improvement plan. He is going to do what he says he is going to do. We cannot stop it from happening. Number three. Jesus must suffer, be rejected, be killed, and be raised because it was planned, listen, it was planned from the foundation of the world. Jesus dying on a cross was not plan B. When, when Eve took that piece of fruit and ate the piece of fruit in rebellion of God, to God, God did not lean back and go, uh-oh, didn't see that coming. When Adam didn't do, and listen, let me just, this is just a little bit of chastisement for a few people that want to, to have this way of thinking. We always want to give Eve the grief because she ate the apple. What was Adam's job? Adam's job was to protect Eve and the creation. And where was that twit at? Where was he? He was there standing at that pretty, staring at that pretty babe, letting her eat that apple, and he did just what he told, she told him to do. That was not his job. His job was to protect her. He did not do that. God did not lean back and go, well, dad gum him. I wanted him to take care of her. What in the world? Now I've got to come up with something. That never happened. Listen, what happened is before the foundation of the world, before God said, let there be light, Isaiah 53 was already written in God's heart. In the very beginning, before he ever created the first thing, before Jesus brought anything into being that came into being, it was already in God's heart that this is the way this is going to operate. That they will eat of the apple. I know they will. I know that's going to happen. And I know that what I want ultimately, and those of you that have studied Revelation, we studied it together, understand that what I want ultimately is I want people who will trust me with all of their hearts to follow me. And in the very end of everything, there's going to be a new Eden. There'll be a new heaven. Y'all remember hearing this? A new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem that is going to be ultimately what he means for it to be. Eden was only a beginning. The end Ending is what he's working towards. It is his purpose and it's been his purpose forever. It was not an accident that Jesus went to the cross. It was never plan B. It was from the beginning and everything will turn out exactly like it's supposed to turn out. Let me help you with something. Some of you younger folks may not be quite as offended as some of us older folks are. We've been around a long time and we sort of got normal in our head what our version of normal is. Now, we have a normal that we know is truth here, but we sometimes add a little normal to it, you know, and, and get a little wonky and a little crazy. We went to Ann Arbor to see Anna. We got there. She took us. Ann Arbor, to help you understand Ann Arbor, Michigan, University of Michigan and Ann Arbor are essentially the same place. University of Michigan is all over the place. And Ann Arbor is incorporated into the University of Michigan. You go south, there's University of Michigan, north, University of Michigan, east, west, it's everywhere you go. And they cater to these students. I mean, of course they do. There's a lot of money to be made up there. We went to this hamburger joint. I thought it was a really, really good hamburger. But it was one of those hamburger joints where they grind their own meat. It's non-GMO. They only feed them certain things like gummy bears on Wednesdays at 3 o'clock. So the cows have a certain taste. They do all this funky, weird stuff to it. But it it was really good hamburger. But as we left, my family is in a little knot talking, and I'm sort of on the outside edge walking around, and there's these three guys walking toward us. One of them looked perfectly normal, just like a, a guy. One of the guys was wearing the shortest, tightest short shorts I have ever seen a human being wear in my life. I have never seen a woman wear a pair of short shorts that was as short and as tight as that boy's shorts were. The other boy that was walking him was wearing a dress. Now he was wearing a dress dress. I don't mean it, was, it wasn't a robe, it was, it was a dress. It was a pretty dress. It was an ankle length dress. And the thing that confused me, the thing that confused me was, 
is that, is that he wasn't trying to look like a girl. You know, normally I have in my mind, because, you know, whatever, right or wrong and different, don't matter, it's what it is, that if you're wearing a dress and you're a guy, you're trying to look like a girl, you're trying to be a girl, that kind of thing. This guy was a guy wearing a dress, just wearing a dress. So after he walked by and, and, and I did this, you know, I was, I was real cool. I don't like to stare at people. That's not polite. I just kept going. You know, because I wanted to see, but I didn't want to. So finally, I, I see, and after he's gone, I talked to Anna about him, and, and I said, I, I, I'm a little confused, honey, because I don't think he was like a transsexual that was trying to do and trying with my stereotypes and all that. I said, he was just a dude wearing a, a dress. And she said, well, yeah, Dad. said, we have folks like that up here. She said, they're non-binary. I said, huh? She said, they don't identify as a guy or a gal. They're just whatever. And if they wake up and they want to wear a suit, they wear a suit. And if they wake up and they want to wear a dress, they wear a dress. That's just what they do. They like to be referred to not as him or her, but as they. And in all of my smart aleckness, I said they like possessed by a bunch of demons, right? I don't think she took that well. But the point being in me telling the story is this. We look out and I watch things going on and we're going to hell in a handbasket. Whole world's going to fall apart and it's just everything's going... Let me help you know understand something. If the scripture is true, and it is, and if the scripture cannot be broken, which we know it can't, we've just said so, and if we say that God's gonna do what God's gonna do, then you know what? Revelation 21 and 22 is gonna happen exactly like it's supposed to. And if, and this is my belief, and this is why I do what I do, if the church would be revived, if we will, if we will grasp with all of our being, the fact of the truth of the scripture and that God is going to do what God says he's gonna do and that he will make these things occur, that he has had this plan since the foundation of the world. If we do that and it becomes real in us, we will become revived. And when we become revived and life is in these old bones, the people outside the world will see that life and some of them will be awakened. And I pray that that happens. Things happen. And see, people wear the dresses. We look at them and go, oh, they're wrong. They're this, they're that. No, they're not. They're lost. That's all it is. They're lost. It's just the same as somebody that, that goes into a drug lifestyle or a lying lifestyle or an adultery lifestyle or any other lifestyle. They're lost. They don't know their way. They don't have a foundation to stand on. They need a foundation. They need a firm foundation. The foundation that we have in the church through Jesus Christ, until we get it that we've got something really, really special, I don't think they can get it. But when we get it, then they can get it and we'll see some of this stop or we'll see some of these lives changed and we'll see people that want to be referred to as they now want to be referred to as he or her. We'll see this happen because of the truth of what the gospel is. They'll have something to stand on. All right, point number four. I get point number four. Jesus must suffer, be rejected, be killed, and be raised because that plan is in place for the ultimate infallible purpose. Y'all remember a few weeks back we studied the Christ hymn in Philippians. Listen to it one more time. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. No, you hear that? Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. He's talking to us. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, and when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason... God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every other name so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. For this reason, what reason? Because he died for our sins? No, for the reason of he was obedient. He was obedient. He was obedient even to death on a cross. He was obedient. Now, I want you to listen carefully. I don't want you to misunderstand this when you leave today, all right? 
there was a song that was sung years back that went, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. It's a pretty song. I like it. I've heard it sung many times. It conveys, conveys the message that we all know that Jesus died for our sins. But why did Jesus do it? Was I on his mind? Was I the only thing that was on his mind when he was on the cross? Philippians 2 would not support that. Philippians 2 wouldn't support that all. What was on Jesus' mind when he was on the cross? He was being obedient to his father. He was being obedient to the plan of his father. He was doing what his daddy had asked him to do. That his daddy had a plan to save us all. A plan formed before the foundation of the world. Conveyed to Jesus through the Holy Scripture. Assured, implemented through the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God the Father. Jesus did what he did because he knew being obedient to my father is going to allow these people to be saved. They're gonna see the glory of my Father. They're gonna see the power of my Father. They're gonna see the love of my Father. And when they see that, they're gonna want that and they will be changed and they will be saved. He was on the cross thinking of his Father. He didn't shout to us, why are you forsaking me? He knew why we were doing it. He said, Father, why are you forsaking me? And the very last thing he said was what? It's finished. I did what you called me to do. I was obedient and now it is done. Now let's try to tie this up so you can ponder it some at home. Jesus, as a man on earth, wholly human yet wholly divine, understood through Holy Scripture that his mission was to be suffered was to suffer, be rejected, die, and rise because that was the Father's plan from the foundation of the earth. And that by doing this, he would prove God's power over sin and death for all eternity so that God the Father would be praised appropriately and completely by every creature on the earth and under the earth so salvation would reign and rule forever. He was on a mission. Now, why does all this matter? Why does all this matter? Why do we just go through this? Why not just say he came and died for our sins, let's all go home? Here's what I think. I think by understanding the trustworthiness of the scripture, understanding that it's true all the time, it's true all the time, whether you feel like it or not, it is true all the time. By seeing the example of Jesus to order his life so that the Father would receive all the glory. Can you imagine what, would, what things would be like if we ordered our life so that God would get the glory? Do you realize how many stupid things you wouldn't do anymore? Do you realize how many good things you would do because you're ordering your life not because I think it's right for my family or it's right for this. I'm doing it because it is for the glory of God understanding that the scripture tells me that when I do that, he's gonna add everything else to me. That, that I order my life like Jesus did so the Father would receive all the glory. That's the mind that Paul tells us to have that we will trust scripture as God's word and that we trust God to accomplish his word and then we'll order our lives according to his word, expecting the pleasures both enjoyable and difficult. Jesus hanging on the cross was still a pleasure to him. He was obedient to death, even death on a cross because he, was knew, he knew he was doing the right thing. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? That while Jesus was on the cross, as painful and horrible as it was, he was still proud, for lack of a better word, that I am doing what daddy required me to do. I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing the noble and honorable and good thing so that all people can be saved. I'm doing this. I'm doing the right thing. Even though it was horrible, it was still a pleasure of God understanding that by ordering our lives this way, we will bring glory to God the Father, that all of creation will be able to see again who he is when they look at us, that God is faithful, and that his truth does endure to all generations. That's what it means to repent. That's what it means to repent and believe. Not simply say that Jesus is Lord, but to say that I will order my life I will order my life to follow you. 
knowing that on the times that I fail and I will fail, that you will be ordering my life for me, that I cannot escape your hand, that I cannot be lost, that I am yours forevermore. That's what we mean. We want every breath of our life to be a song of praise to the Father that loves us so much. Y'all pray with me. Holy Father, hear now our confession. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all of my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. Dear Father, thank you for your miraculous gift of our salvation through the obedience of your Son, Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior. Now with every, how, every head continued to be bowed and every eye continued to be closed, I ask you to consider a few things. If you are a child of God, if you feel the Spirit stirring in your heart, calling you to a deeper trust in the scripture in a more committed obedience to the word will you whisper a word to the father now will you tell him this moment of your desire to order your life to follow him more will you tell him right now how much you love him and how much you want to trust him and believe that he will deliver more faith and trust to you and if you have never trusted Christ, if you've never committed your life to Christ, but this morning you feel a stirring in your soul and you know that you're, you know that you're not right. You know that you're not living right. You know that, that you're under your control and, and, and it's not going well. Even it may be the most wonderful thing in the world and yet still you feel it's not where it's supposed to be. It's because you're separated from God. And he's calling you home. That's the stirring that you feel in your heart. He's calling out to you. And I ask you this morning to answer that call. If you would like to trust Christ as your Savior, and don't do it, don't do it just to say you're doing it, but to say truly, I want to follow you. Would you pray this prayer with me? Lord, I give up my right to run my life, and I hand that right over to you right now. I will follow you to the best of my ability from now on. Please be my Lord and my Savior and save me. And if you pray that prayer earnestly and sincerely, the Lord heard you and he's written your name down as his. I invite you, if you did that in just a moment, as Logan and Becca are going to sing, they're the only ones that are going to sing this morning. As they sing and we pray, I invite you to come tell me so we can get your journey started. And if coming down in front of people is too much, wait until after the service is over and grab me. But let's talk and let's get the journey started. And if you've been attending First Baptist but haven't taken the step to join us, today's a good day for that. God did not lead you here to be a spectator. He brought you here to be a part of a community, working together, loving together, striving together to find Jesus and give Jesus away. I would ask you to come forward now too. If everyone would please stand and keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Be talking to the Father about, about Him as Becca and Logan sing. How deep the Father's love for us How vast 
beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the father turns Which more the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking. sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his Pray with me. <coughs> Lord, I'm so grateful that we live in a country where we have the opportunity to come and worship you in freedom without persecution. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who rode in on a donkey, knowing that he would be persecuted and actually die to save us from our sins. Lord, thank you for loving us so much you gave us our son. As we go today, go with us, protect us, and bring us back next week to a special time when we celebrate your son's death and resurrection. All these things I ask in your son's name. Amen.